because what we know from history is that it's often during recessions that some of the most brilliant ideas and the most successful businesses are born. In these challenging times, businesses need to be focused on getting back to the basics, actively listening, training and learning, and surrounding ourselves with people who will challenge and encourage us, says today's guest. Hi, I'm Joshua Carlson, and in today's Ask an Expert segment, I'm going to be sitting down with Rohit Talwar, who is an author, an international speaker, and he's also the founder of an organization called Fast Future, which is a futurist think tank focused on helping businesses drive strategy and innovation. Now let's get started. Uh, Rohit, welcome. Thank you for coming on our Ask an Expert segment. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Perfect. So I'm really interested to learn some of the things that you guys are working on over at your company. Um, but before we dig into that, I'm big on origin stories. So I would love to hear about how your company came to be. So I guess uh, you can blame Neil Armstrong for this. The, okay. As a kid, I was fascinated by the moon landings and this idea that we could go to another planet. And then that kind of evolved into this interest in the future and what, what, what Zwacka talked about as what happens after what happens next. And that really stuck with me. So through education, I kind of moved into the tech field, into consulting, and was always really interested in asking why people were doing what they were doing, what was their view of the future, and would anything change that? And I discovered this whole field of future studies and I fell in love. It just felt like the place that I wanted to be, researching the future, talking about the future, helping people make sense of what hadn't happened yet and helping them really use it to make better decisions, whether in their own lives, in their businesses or for their countries. And so that's kind of the origin story. Lots of healthy accidents on the way, lots of uh, interesting kind of serendipitous moments that accelerated me on the path and lots of challenges in terms of shocks to the world like the current pandemic that have really forced me to question what is the value of futures work and to discover that actually it's one of the most powerful tools we have to help us navigate through and beyond what's going on now. Well, you mentioned something, um, researching the future, which is an interesting concept. Um, I think there's a lot of people that futurism is kind of a nebulous thing. Could you kind of articulate what futurism is really all about and how that process uh, comes to be? Yeah, so there's a common misconception that futurists uh, or, or futurism is about predicting what's going to happen next. Yeah. And that's one very small subset, and it's either right or wrong. So... It's not the part I play in. Okay. Myself and a lot of the other futurists and the people who've contributed to the book we're going to talk about later, we're all much more interested in exploring what are the forces, the ideas, the emerging possibilities, and what's going on in science, and how might they come together to create different possible scenarios for the future to help people then rehearse that future and then make better decisions today based on testing our ideas against a range of possibilities. It's exactly what the military do. They create a bunch of scenarios for any situation right. and they're prepared for all of them. And what we see around the world today is that the governments that did the best forward thinking, the best scenario planning for the future, yep. have come out of this crisis almost unscathed. You know, Taiwan, a handful of deaths. Hong Kong, a handful of deaths. New Zealand, Singapore. And interestingly enough, the reason for that is that they're all doing this forward thinking that feeds their risk assessment, their preparedness, and they have plans for a range of contingencies. I live in the UK. We're up there amongst the worst and least prepared countries. With the result that we have, you know, the, one of the worst infection rates and one of the worst death rates. And so people are beginning to understand that actually by scanning what's coming, by identifying the risks and the opportunities, you can prepare for them and therefore not be shocked by, by anything that happens. But also you can put in place mechanisms that you can kick into action when something happens, whether that's distributing medical equipment and having much more localized control so you can respond fast 
whether it's an environmental emergency, uh, a, a, a major car incident, a terrorist incident, or a health incident, as we've seen. Uh, but it also means that you, you have in place mechanisms like uh, the ability to pay citizens when you have to ask them to stop working and stay at home. Right. It's all those things, the track and trace systems, you know, all of that stuff. If you've got your act together and you're thinking ahead, you can plan these things. It means you can act fast. Your lockdowns can be shorter. Your crisis period can be shorter. And the overall economic impact can be much less severe. So it's interesting, again, that the least prepared countries that have perhaps made the most noise about the pandemic and, and the fact that they don't want to do too much too quickly right, and right. protect the economy, they're the ones whose economies are going to be worst hit. Okay. Well, so let's talk about this because you guys have just recently completed a book called Aftershocks and Opportunities. Um, tell us what this is about and, and kind of what you guys have seen from that. Yeah, so like everyone else, you know, we were hit quite heavily by the pandemic. All of our global speaking was shut down very quickly. And what we could see was that our clients weren't in the mood to talk to anyone about the future. They were really dealing with the here and now. How do I adapt? How do I get my act together and make sure my business can run day to day? But what we knew is that by about now, those businesses would be moving on and thinking about the next phase and thinking about, well, how will we navigate through the longer term? What does this mean for our strategy? What does this mean for how we organize as a business? And so we thought it'd be great to have a book come out at the beginning of June, just at that time. Sure. And went out on the 20th of March to a whole bunch of people we knew and also via social media we asked for thousand word chapters. So we figured we'd only get about 40 to 50 uh, because we only gave people a one month window to respond in. Right. We actually got 115 chapters. So we split <laughs> the very best of them into two books. The first came out on June the 1st and that one's called Aftershocks and Opportunities, Scenarios for a Post-Pandemic Future. The second, which will be catchily titled Aftershocks and Opportunities 2, will come out in September. And really, we're trying to focus on what might change, but also what might stay the same. Because one of the things I keep saying to people is that if we look back in two years' time, I think we're going to be unpleasantly surprised by the amount that hasn't changed in our world. Right. But also a lot will change. So in the book, we talk about some of the critical shifts and scenarios that could play out. We talk about some of the changes in society and social policy that people anticipate or that might be required. We talk about the implications for government and the economy. And finally, we look at what this could all mean for the future of business and technology. So there's some really rich chapters from some incredible thinkers. And they're a mix of, if you like, narratives about what might happen and, and a discussion of the different possibilities through to people painting scenarios set at a different point in time. And there's some great ones. You know, we've done some opening scenarios looking at both how the pandemic might evolve, but also how the economic recovery might evolve. Right. So you're going to kind of cross axes, you've got four scenarios, and they're used by people to plan. What we find is that people are generally very, very, very bad at planning for the worst case scenario. Naturally, as humans, we want to be optimistic, we're growth orientated. So we all want to focus on the recovery. But right now, it's really important to think about that scenario where the pandemic isn't eradicated for a couple of years. Right. And the economic recovery takes a couple of years. Because what we know from history is that it's often during recessions that some of the most brilliant ideas and the most successful businesses are born. And so this is a good time to be thinking about that because the ideas we have could work then under any scenario. And then the rest of the book, you know, as I say, we, we've got all these ideas, we've got scenarios about the future of the US, about what would uh, happen if we call the pandemic too early, and a really interesting one around what would life be like for kids and their teachers in in 2037 so kids who were born as a result of the uh, you know yeah. the pandemic 
it be like for the lockdowns? What would their lives be like? What would their worldview be, be like? And how might their view differ so dramatically to that of the teachers who'd lived through it? A brilliant chapter, really interesting. So there's so much rich content and um, really well written by the, by the individual authors. And, and the great thing is these are all chapters of about a thousand words. So literally you can read them in a five minute break between Zoom calls. Uh, <laughs> Or, you know, if you used to commute, whatever you now do to fill your commute time, you can read the book in, you know, a couple of sittings. And it was deliberately intended to be that way so that okay. people could just immerse themselves in the future and then start to feed the ideas into their work. Okay, well, I'm excited to hear that you have a second book coming out because my follow-up question was kind of around, I feel like we've been hit with this perfect storm um, across three fronts. So obviously the pandemic from a health standpoint hit us aggressively and hit us fast at first, but immediately following that was an economic, you know, depression. Um, now we're in the midst of social unrest, right? It's really, it's kind of been the, the powder keg that's that sparked off. So I'm curious if you guys are, are looking at that and will be probably having any insights with that, uh, with that second book. Well, it's interesting. We, we, we're having a debate about whether we should ask for someone to write a chapter that really focuses on that issue of social movements. A lot of people in the first book talk about that and a lot of the chapters in the second book touch a bit on, on that, but none of the chapters were written prior to the George Floyd incident and the, the rise of the Black Lives Matter movement uh, or the, the resurgence of it. But I think the general themes are there that, you know, what we're seeing is protest against a system that feels unthinking, unfair, unbalanced, right. and in the case of the Black Lives Matter movement, definitely not colorblind. And so there's a recognition that there'll be a lot of pressure to change things, whether it's through the ballot box, whether it's you know, pressure on organizations to change the way they behave, whether it's just socially, our friends now taking a different view. One of the most powerful things we've seen is that if you look at the people on the protests, most of them probably voted for the first time in the last election here in the UK or the last election in the US or might be first time voters this time around. And they're really aware that we need to do things differently. We need different systems, we need different values, we need different behaviours and we need a more globally inclusive picture. And I think there's a, in that generation in particular, they totally get that climate change is a global phenomenon. Uh, that the pandemic travels around the world in seat 43C of a plane. So whilst any country has the pandemic, we all are at risk. And that inequality and, and racial bias, minority bias, discrimination are there in every country. Whether it's the horrible figures around women achieving equality around uh, promotion and pay you know it's still over 200 years for us to get to parity which is nonsense right. or it's around the treatment of people with disabilities or it's about the myriad issues that that people of color feel uh, but perhaps the most powerful thing that's going to come out of this is this shift from telling people what the answer is to the problem they're experiencing and them saying, well, hang on, you've not answered the question we have. You've right. not acted on the issue we're raising. You've, you've solved a different problem. This time around, I think there's a much greater understanding that the most powerful thing we can do is listen. And that's, I think, the, the lesson that organizations and governments can take into everything they're doing. You know, we've deliberately not made a single sales call since February when we saw this evolving. We haven't tried to sell anything to anyone in that period. Right. If they approach us, we'll talk about it. What we have done is an immense amount of listening to our clients and people in the marketplace to say, how does your world feel? What's changing? What do you see coming? What are you best and least prepared for? Because for us, we think this is a brilliant immersion in learning that we can then turn into effective solutions. But I think right now, the, the lesson for all of us from this big social shift 
is this idea of, li of listening and listening far more and responding far more. And we've become really good at rapid responses in the pandemic to all sorts of things. So we've demonstrated that we can move at speed. If we can take an entire organization of, you know, 20, 30, 80,000 people and move them from offices to, to working from home and see almost no impact on productivity, then we know we can do massive things at speed. And, and all the issues that are being raised around the world, and it's not one issue, I think we can make a lot more progress than we anticipated. And it's interesting that it's not a direct aspect of the pandemic that's going to drive the most shift, but the fact that a lot of us were at home, so we were all seeing the same videos. Right. The media were bored out of their skins with talking about the pandemic. So the story became one that they've given a lot of attention to. And secondly, I think young people around the world really mobilizing and saying, this is our moment to really hammer home some big messages and to try and affect change. Uh, and so that combination are in a sense, second order effects of the pandemic, but they could be the biggest outcomes. Yeah, that's, that's a good perspective. Um, I, I hadn't thought of it from that standpoint, but I definitely do agree with the listening aspect, really taking time um, to not just be thinking of a solution before the question has even been finished. Um, because I do feel that that's a, that's a byproduct that's happened a lot. Um, I'm curious from, from what you've experienced and what you've seen, do you think that there is a methodology that small businesses can adopt to evaluate kind of what their value proposition is today and if they should be pivoting? Because I think there's a lot of businesses out there that are, you know, they're trying to, to get by right now, but they're not sure what, what the future holds. So they're not sure what they should be doing right now. So methodology always makes this sound bigger than it should be and always makes it sound like there's a science there. I, th I think this is about going back to basics, actually. The first thing is that listening. Listening to your customers, you know, reading what's going on in the marketplace, very actively asking questions of your friends in business and of your employees. What are they seeing changing? What are their friends and family seeing changing? What are they spending money on? Which are the sectors where there seems to be growth? And what, do, what could that mean for us? You know, are we in the line of opportunity? Are we where the money is flowing? Right. Or are we a really difficult sell somewhere in the margins that people don't want? So, you know, for example, if I'm a restaurant in a main street, I'm really in trouble. Because A, I've got to socially distance. B, people are hesitant about coming back. So I have, I've had to re, you know, repurpose myself as a, a home delivery offering, uh, an event catering, and a business catering offering. And, and what we're seeing is that the people who are doing the listening and kind of asking know that we still want to consume food. We still want to consume nice food. We still want to con consume fast food. We just don't want to go into those places. Right. So they're repositioning. And, and in every sector, what we're seeing is those who are doing the listening those who are doing the sniffing out of opportunity, brilliant. The second is about training and learning. This is really our opportunity to acknowledge that without learning and training, we're not gonna to get to the future as quickly. Plenty of opportunity for people to be learning anything and everything at home. And the more skills we can acquire, and the faster we can experiment with new things. The great thing is now, that you, you can get education on anything and everything. If you've decided that you want to pivot your business from being a, you know, a company that ran physical yoga classes, physical exercise classes in a gym to doing it online, well, now people teaching you how to do that, not just how to deliver it, but how to run it. Right. Uh, you can go to all the major education institutions and get education for free. You know, take Harvard X hundreds of thousands of people signing up to their entrepreneurship classes. You only pay if you want the certificate, but you can get education for free. So now is that phenomenal opportunity to get out there and do some learning. There's also great platforms now that will allow you to link into the experts. So not just an academic introduction, but talk to someone working in the industry, 
to ask your specific questions. So you move up your learning curve faster. So once we've started listening and looking out there and started learning, the third thing is about who are you surrounding yourselves with? Uh, who are the people that you talk to most about what we're going to do next? Is it the people in your organization who tend to pour cold water on every idea? Right. Even though they know the current ones won't work? Is it the people in your friends and family who, you know, always look like they're, they're kind of desperate and miserable because they're not going to put fuel in, in, in your engine? It's really being selective now about who you talk to about your ideas. It doesn't mean cut your friends and family out, but it means who do you talk to about the ideas? Who do you, who's going to give you encouragement? And who's going to ask you good questions like, that's great. What are you going to do next? So they're, they're constantly pushing you to take the next right step. Sure. And then it's about how do you find your voice, particularly if you're changing what you do? How do you get your voice out? Obviously, you can use the web and social media. But again, it's about how do you use friends, family, all the networks of your employees? How do you get to your voice being heard? broadly in the communities that you want to target. So joining the right groups on social media. So you're in there, not pitching your wares, but again, hearing the conversation, adding value through your insights, asking interesting questions. You can amplify your voice very, very quickly by doing completely the reverse of what we thought we should do, which was selling. Right. And that's really powerful. So, so, that, you know, if that's a methodology, great, let's patent it. But, you know, listen, get out there, do some training, and then get your voice heard in the communities where you want to be pro offering your propositions. Those are really important. Obviously, attached to that is a willingness to experiment in the design of the offering, the pricing of it, how it gets delivered, and being really flexible to adapt to what the market is telling you. Because as much as we think we know what we want to do and what the market wants, it's only when we launch that we find out whether the market thinks we've got a winner or you know a disaster. So that ability to adapt and flex is really important. You know, this is that kind of time where the most interesting conversations I'm having are with business leaders who are signing up at a phenomenal rate for classes in Buddhism. I, I'm amazed at this. That. Almost every day I'm talking to people about what they're doing. And I would say one third of my conversations now, people are taking classes in slowing down, in mindfulness, in Buddhism, because what they're saying is they need to let go. They've got all these assumptions and these buckets of experience and all of these ways we used to do things and the ways we made ourselves successful. And instead of being the kind of, amplifiers of our business now they're like ropes pulling us back to the past right and learning how to let go of that learning that our past our ideas all of that may have no relevance is a really humble thing to do but what i'm seeing is it's changing those people at a dramatic rate and their openness to new ideas their willingness to consider new possibilities their ability to experiment and their capacity to engage their workforce in this is just mind blowing. And, and so this is an unexpected development from slowing down, uh, you know, as a, as a global economy. But this is an, a one-time opportunity to really rehearse how we're gonna to get to the future in a very different way. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, I, I'm curious, is a futurist and is everything that we're talking about right now one of the um, one of the impacts that we've seen are students right um, and so on the surface we've seen students that are graduating you know with no audience they're not getting the accolades that they they would have wanted but I'd like to approach this slightly differently um, and, and maybe target the high schoolers what do you think high schoolers which direction do you think high schoolers should be looking at as they're looking at their future education in college what are the areas that you think that they should be focused on? It's really difficult because, you know, there are so many industries. The global economy is about $86 trillion. It's going to grow to about $120 trillion. There's room for quite a few sectors in there, you know, and 50% and of that growth is going to come from businesses and sectors that have only just started or don't yet exist. 
Right. So there's an, a phenomenal opportunity out there. The, the key is that they're looking and finding what interests them. I think what's really going to be successful in, in the coming years is people following their interest and discovering that there's a community of interest and that you can either build a business in that or you can join it. So whether it happens to be data mining and artificial intelligence, whether it's you know green eco solutions, whether it's becoming a therapist because Lord knows we're going to need a lot more of those. You know, we already do online therapy is one of the big growth industries. Right. Uh, so it's, it's following your passion more and more and really asking yourself what interests you, what motivates you, because that will really encourage people to take the next steps. I would say that the single biggest, scariest and toughest challenge facing high schoolers is getting their parents to shut up mm. because their parents went through a different education system, right. built their careers in a different era, were basing their worldview on a world that no longer exists and won't come back anytime soon. So that advice they're giving is at best useless and possibly toxic. Right. So the challenge is about parents stepping back and just encouraging their kids to learn, to look, and learning how to ask better and better questions that get their kids thinking, but giving less and less advice because our parents have no idea about the world we're moving into. You've got people who are becoming rock stars on TikTok. <laughs> uh, you know, most parents haven't got a clue what TikTok is unless their kids have made a video of them looking, doing something stupid. <laughs> and then put it on TikTok, right? They, they don't understand the world we're moving into in the same way because it's being created by that generation in part. So, you know, the real challenge for high schoolers is, is there's an abundance of opportunity coming. You know, I'm not one of those people who believes that this is the end of the world. We all need to start building our kind of, you know, lockdown shelters and never come out again and just make sure you've got enough food for the next 10 years. You know, we are going to see growth. There is incredible innovation happening in this time. There's incredible advances. The human spirit is very powerful. The creators are still there. The change agents are there. There's going to be huge opportunity. And the real thing we can do for our kids coming out of high school, but also coming out of university, is just give them massive encouragement, ask them lots of good questions. And, and prop them up whenever they get their 50th rejection letter from a, an employer. Right. That's what we can do. But telling them what to do is a kind of guarantee of failure. Unless, you know, we're moving them into the family business, then we do want to give them some acquired knowledge about how not to blow away 17 generations of, uh, of what we've built. But, you know, that, that's not very many people on the planet who have that luxury. So... You know, for most of us, it is about just creating the right environment for our kids to, to feel supported, to feel like their parents are encouraging them to learn and pursue their interests and, and just constantly asking good questions. It sounds like what I'm hearing is whether it's, um, you know, whether it's parenting, whether it's running a business or whether it's just me looking internally, listening is this general theme, right? Uh, actually paying attention to the thoughts, to the ideas that are coming up and giving them an environment to, uh, to explore, right? To, to validate. Who knew? Listen, learn, experiment. That, you know, that's kind of, that is the mantra now because no one knows what the answer is. But if we're not listening and we're not learning, then we're definitely not going to do good experiments. Okay. Well, uh, I don't want to keep you too long, but I do uh, like to finish with, you know, are there any other concepts or ideas that you think are important that businesses should be focused on right now? Yeah. I and mean, I think this is the time to be really alongside you know, everything we've talked about, making sure that you're investing your time in your people um, and your time in yourself. Let's start with yourself. One of the big issues I think for a lot of business leaders is this is incredibly stressful. Yeah. And we've probably never had this level of stress before where there's such uncertainty about how long this might last and what it could look like on the other side. So you need an outlet. You need to find people you can talk to, whether that's friends, that's great. But I think going and finding the coach, the counselor, the therapist or whoever 
is the biggest sign of strength I see right now okay. in leaders. Having someone who can just help you frame problems. If you had a broken leg, if you caught some sort of flu, you wouldn't hesitate to go to a professional to help you fix it. Right. You wouldn't say, no, I'm going to sort my leg out myself. You know, just give me some <laughs> gaffer tape. I'll tape up my leg. I'll be cool. Right. You know, so going to professionals who can help, I think, is really important right now. It's an outlet. Get rid of all that stuff that you can't really get rid of it with anyone else. And then reframe. And then your staff are having exactly the same issues. So how do you as a leader show up to them day in, day out, uh, in your conversations, you know, I have a daily check-in with my business manager. It's one of the first things we do. And as much as I have 22 different things I want to talk about, I start with asking how she is, and okay. then I start with what's on her agenda. Okay. And that just diffuses any kind of sense of for her that she's not being listened to or heard. Sure. And then I can talk about what my priorities are, and then we have a discussion about, well, how does what I'm asking for relate to what she's asking for? And we agree the priorities and they do shift day to day. And that, that ability to be heard in every context, the ability to talk about issues, I think is so important. And we as leaders have to do that with our direct reports, with others in the organization, but just to make sure that we're building that sense that not only are we having conversations, but we're hearing what's being said. Uh, and taking action to make the environment better. Particularly for those businesses who are running on web webinars at the moment and video, and possibly likely to do that for some time to come, it's very tiring to be sat in front of a screen all day long communicating with other people. Sure. Very different dynamic than physical. So just recognizing what that feels like and making sure we're building in the breaks and the activities and the fun to, to take some of the pressure out, to take some of the tension out. The other thing I would say right now is, I mean, obviously I don't have to tell any business owner that looking at your, your cost base is really important, but actually be willing to be even more experimental. So how many of the resources that you purchased do you really need? Right? How many of those are being used when they're sat in the office? how much of office space do you need? You know, people, I hear, I hear these agonized conversations with people where they say, oh, we don't know, We've, our lease is coming up, should we get a smaller premises? And I say, well, don't get one at all. Right? <laughs> try, try for a while, either with a rented office that's much smaller, or, you know, on these managed workspaces, or even better, just don't. Just have everyone working from home have your tech st stuff in, you know, in a physical space that you have to rent. Let's see how you get on. So you've got infinite flexibility then to then scale up to what you really think you need. Right. But don't hang on to these big edifices because you're scared to move to something flexible and more sm and smaller. So you know, it is about being really radical as well in some of those choices. Yeah, I totally agree. I, it makes me think that WeWork was just a little bit ahead of where, you know, this opportunity, because I do feel like these big companies, they have realized that they can actually operate without losing any efficiency, actually gaining efficiencies, but without losing any productivity. And they're sitting on, you know, millions of dollars of real estate that are now empty. And it had been proven that they don't actually need them. So I'm, from that standpoint, I am very curious to see how, you know, the actual physical office landscape um, kind of evolves over the next couple of years. Yeah, I think whenever we were, was born, it was going to be a disaster. So, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you can't build a business. That's like saying, let me go out there and buy retail outlets or rent retail outlets everywhere just in case someone might want to come and sell from my shop. Right. You don't do that unless you're, a, you know, if you're a shopping center, you might do that because you know how to manage it, but even they're struggling. Yeah. But, you know, a shopping mall. But, you know, go out and rent all these blocks with no idea if you could fill them, no idea if people were willing to pay the charges you're, you're talking about, and no idea how sustainable that might be is really hard. And, and they've learned that as every other managed office space provider has learned, it's a business model that's fundamentally flawed because you've got no distinctive advantage. And as soon as you think you're getting successful with someone because they're growing and they're taking more space, 
the first thing they want to do is to get out and halve their rental costs by right. getting a bigger space. And right now, everyone who's got office space is going to be wanting to let that out on relatively short lengths at, at a cost that just about covers their heating and lighting bills. Right. So WeWork is going to have the ground taken from underneath. It. You know, it, 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 if, if its investors want to keep pouring money in, that's their choice. But it's not a good investment, I would say. Okay. Fair enough. Uh, well, I appreciate you coming on today. Um, I look forward to the, uh, to the second book coming out in September. Um, and hopefully we can have you, uh, have you on again then. Brilliant. Thank you. My pleasure. It's been a lot of fun. All right. Thank you. Thank you.